This week, we're strutting our stuff with Simonson Taxidermy. Uncovering the detail of one of the oldest art forms in the world. And the art behind trying to trick fish. Rick Whittier builds fish decoys. Trust us, his painting skills steal the show. And we're kicking it out on the lake with these guys. Let's find out how Minnesota's most unique fly fishing boat floats. People are passionate about outdoor equipment. Get this, Americans spend more than $20 billion a year on gear. But no one ever really sees how their stuff gets made. Well, that's where we come in. Each week, we throw open the factory doors and give you a behind the scenes look at how your favorite gear is made. Made for the outdoors. Uh, hi there, welcome to the show, I'm Bill Shirk. And I'm Lindsay Hayes, and Bill, don't worry, he's harmless. But the world of taxidermy is full of works of art just like this guy. And capturing moments of the outdoors is what Simonson Taxidermy is all about. I think he just moved. There's nothing like a tom strutting in the spring. Turkey fever at its finest. Within minutes, a memory is made. Boy, that is a dandy. One that never gets old <laughs> and is cherished. Preserving the memory more than the mount is what taxidermy is all about. It's an art and a craft that's been perfected and practiced for centuries. Today, it's evolved to a form of wildlife art. Fish, birds, mammals, in any shape, size, and mount. North Country Taxidermy in Coon Rapids, Minnesota is home to award-winning taxidermist Rick Simonson. For 30 years, this avid angler and fisherman has mastered his own artistic detail, feather by feather, mount by mount. Well, I started when I was 12 years old. I would trap mice and I would skin them out. And I'd mount pigeons and I just had an interest for it. My dad said that at about age seven that he never had to clean another fish. That's Bryn, she's my helper. She's my companion, my best buddy, aren't you, huh? This is a Miriam out of the Black Hills that I'm working on today. The striding turkey is the hardest thing to do in taxidermy. The dome feathers up here stand up, so you get that dome look and that real round look to it. So yeah, they're very difficult to do. What I do is I lay a, a little ball of cotton behind each feather, and there's a lot of feathers in here. That's pretty good. Replicating a tom takes patience. The bird is skinned, and the feathers are dried in a tumbler. A polyurethane form is chosen to match the size of the bird. The legs, neck, and wings are then wired into place. The head of the turkey is freeze-dried for about six weeks and then painted. The lacquer paint provides the color, which brings the mount to life. There it is. Finished. It's kind of a strange business to be in. Mounting dead things that are going to go in people's houses and so on. And I can understand the aversion. My own wife, she doesn't want things in the house. You know, it's all out here in, in the showroom. And I shot this doll sheep several years ago in, in Alaska. 
Yeah, I like this is probably my favorite mount. Replicating that moment. I'll take the left one. Okay, you take the right one. At the edge of the field on a spring afternoon. When that Iowa town followed the hens in and made his final strut. And after the bird, it's on to the next big buck or fish. Preserving a spring tradition, a family tradition, the taxidermy tradition. Up next, we head to a North Dakota basement to tackle dust and spray paint in search of the next big lure. Made for the Outdoors is brought to you by Splash Products, Access Covers, Game Fair, and Coats RV and Ice Cabins. In the world of fishing, there are all kinds of big time bait manufacturers building some pretty cool stuff. Like that one a lot. <laughs> but sometimes it's the little guy with the most unusual baits that <laughs> truly lure us in. Ice fishing has become one of winter's most popular sports. At least around here. But who knew sitting over an ice hole could also include art? Created in Rick Whittier's dusty North Dakota basement. use fish decoys to attract northern pike to spearing holes. On the trusty winter yeah. decoy. Yep. Went and don't use one of these. Came in nice and slow, just came right in. Turns out the decoys attract something else too. People. Lots of them. Collectors covet decoys, especially Whittier. Rick and his wife Connie ship all over the world. On a regular basis, Australia, Britain, South Africa, China. Rick starts each decoy with a pattern. He's got literally hundreds for about every fish you can imagine. Fresh water and even salt. What I really enjoy is that we make 400 different species. Rick outlines on blocks of white pine. Then he cuts each decoy. Sanding helps rough out the body shape. This is white pine. White pine is strong, but yet soft enough to carve. With the decoy now shaped, Rick starts to grind in the details. The face, the gills, the eyes. Decoys need ballast to sit just right in the water. Rick drills holes for weight. Then he melts lead in his tiny homemade foundry. He hand pours the perfect amount to keep the decoy upright in the water and balanced. While the metal cools, Rick mixes epoxy. He covers the weight, and Connie picks up more sandpaper. After he dremels, there's all kinds of waves, and we gotta get it nice and smooth. And I gotta get all the waves out of it. Connie focuses on finishing the fish body. He'll cut a gill, and then I gotta sand, and then he'll cut another gill, and I gotta sand. And then he cuts a third gill, and I sand again. My fingertips kept starting to bleed. Every day I start working around noon. And from there I, I work till anywhere from five to seven in the morning. 
This is during our prime season, which it seems like our prime season lasts forever. It's the only way we can keep up. Oh, we can go 16 and 18 hours and then take a two or three hour nap. Okay, one sunfish done. Once the decoy passes inspection, Rick rolls on texture. He uses a special tool that dimples the wood and creates scales. After a quick break, the magic of Whittier decoys unfolds. Winter anglers covet Whittier fish decoys, both for use in spearing houses and on collecting shells. It's a small area, we have a small house, very small house, and we produce more realistic decoys than anyone else in the world. With the decoy sanded and hands properly calloused, Rick and Connie Whittier transition from hand power to horsepower. Rick pinches metal between wood. He then glides the layers through a jigsaw. He cuts fins unique to each individual decoy. After shaping, he then squeezes each into place. A bit of cleanup, and the rough fish decoy looks just about complete. Rick also drills a small hole in each head for the hanging eye. Then, Connie connects a string and takes each decoy for a swim. She looks to make sure each fish circles in a tight and controlled pattern without sinking too fast. The fish must glide naturally in the water. After she gives a thumbs up, the Whittier decoy story really shakes out. See, Rick paints fine details, but he does it without an airbrush. No, I've never used one. I don't know how. <laughs> Yep, he uses plain old Kansas spray paint. In seconds, Rick creates each decoy's identity. It's where they do come alive, yep. I try to always leave my painting for waking up because that gives me a, a really good reason to wake up, come to the shop. People come week after week down here to see what I do and after nine years, I find it boring and I don't understand why, why can't you do this? You know, because to me it's so simple. It takes just a couple quick minutes to complete painting. Each decoy hangs, drying. And trust me, it never takes long before they go right out the door. They're gonna trade them, they're gonna sell them, they're gonna buy them, but they're always gonna, you know, enjoy them. We're putting a lot of decoys out there and they'll always be out there. Uh, whether I'm here or gone, that's what's important. Up next, grab your waders and a pair of flippers. We're kicking it out on the lake with these guys to find out more about a unique fishing invention. You're watching Made for the Outdoors. Made for the Outdoors is brought to you by Banks Outdoors, Open Air Solutions, Wiley Point Lodge, Midwest Steel Dealers, and by Central Boiler. Welcome back to the show. It's now time to go fly fishing. I've got my gear, a new rod, Roger helped me pick out a few flies. And when it comes to a good fly fishing boat, I think I know a few guys. Fun in the land of 10,000 lakes is endless. Especially... Nothing like an old man trying to lift a boat. ...when fishing with these three. I'm ready for a great day. Steve London, Klaus Vandersanden, and Ray Wakefield are their own version of the Three Stooges. <laughs> this is a trolling motor. Best friends with a whole lot of character. You can sense the nerves already just under the surface. Uh, we're going to go get them. And that's it. This is probably one of the most unique boats made in Minnesota. The Lost Creek Kickboat. It somewhat resembles a canoe, has oars like a paddle boat, 
There's this nice, comfy seat in the center, and you are your own trolling motor. Steve is the brainchild behind this mini cruiser. Oh, there we go. But his vision was to meet the needs of his two best friends. This is a nice way to fish with a bunch of us because we can kind of all go explore different things and keep an eye on the other guy and see if he's catching fish. Oh, there we go. We were kind of looking for the perfect fly fishing machine. It's like the quest for the Holy Grail. Just make them real big. <laughs> you know, about gay big. I hope you really have a Super X telephoto. This guy may be the day's smallest. And their favorite flies aren't the only thing that's catching some attention. And the fact that they're made out of wood, I think, appeals to a lot of people. Steve's boat business is based in his Twin Cities basement. I spend some time down here almost every night. Let's hope it doesn't fly off on you here. And through the years, there have been a few trials and errors. Now this is the Smithsonian here. Well, this is my first attempt at a kick boat. It actually works, but it's quite ugly. Well, now I call it the X1 because it's experimental. His second effort was the X2. This was going to be the ultimate fishing machine. It's got an insulated cooler, and then this is, of course, for tackle. The latest version is the X3. It has the same storage space, but is more compact for hauling. The guys wanted a light, portable boat that could sneak into the shallow water but also be capable of handling the mighty Mississippi. This vision started on paper, followed by picking the perfect wood. Well, wood is just beautiful. I like the look of it, I like the feel of it, and in some cases, I even like the smell of it. So far, I've been using cherry, walnut, and some Douglas fir. Various machines shape and carve the frame. It's more like building a model airplane because of the light materials you're working with. The shell of the boat is made from Okubi plywood. Once you get the parts made, they're pretty easy to put together. It's basically just gluing things up and assembling things. I just use packing tape. Hold it together until the epoxy sets up. And then the inside will be filled with epoxy. so I get a, a real strong joint. Once the hulls are assembled, the fiberglassing begins. The plywood is sheathed with a polyester resin, every step perfected with years of practice. They look like they've been around a long time. I mean, it, it doesn't look like a design that somebody just came up with a few years ago. Now these boats can be stacked in the back of a mid-sized car, and it only takes a few minutes to assemble. These are all flies that cloth ties. Oh no. <laughs> oh darn it. Oh, see that? This is way better than a canoe, I can tell you that. I used to do a canoe and, you know, in the water, I mean, in the wind, the canoe is all over the place. Perfect to sneak their way into those quiet spots and kick their way through the land of 10,000 lakes. Oh, I think this is the way to live. So, Bill, that's the end of season one. I can't believe it. <laughs> we made it. Well, there really are so many products and we're just getting warmed up. Yeah, and I guess that's why we expect everyone to be back for season number two. <laughs> that's right, and also don't forget to check out our Facebook page as well. There, I'm out of here. Really, Bill? It's fake. Now that's why you love the outdoors. He's just chilling. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. Look at that swivel, Rick. Woo! We have one more package to wrap. OK, let's go. It's like a bike.
Biker Gang. Watch out. Something strange in the neighborhood. Who are you going to call? Oh, I got it. Thanks. Working at the car wash. Little floor. What? Little floor. Floor. Jeff, that looks fun, the staple gun. Can I do right. that, Jeff? No way. All you needed was a bucket and your pole. But the world of taxidermy is full of works of art, just like this guy. Ew, don't poke the bear.